Yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Good morning. Good morning. Friends, Jesus taught that love is the center of everything. It is that to which the whole of Scripture points. It is the only worthwhile measure of our lives. It is the only thing that can change ourselves and our world for the better. So our work this morning is the same as it is every morning, is the same as it is every day. That is to ground ourselves more and more in that love. So whoever you are, wherever you are, whether you're live here at Shannon Beach, whether you're joining us via Zoom, however you are in your spirit, whatever you may have done over the course of your life or just the course of this week, we want you to know that we are glad to have you here with us and join us in this holy work. We want to begin this worship uh, service as we do every worship service between Hillside and Sanctuary, and that is with the lighting of our Christ candle. Uh, and I wonder if we have any young friends who could tell us why we light this candle at the beginning of every single worship service. Because Jesus is the light of the world. Does everybody agree? Yeah. We agree. Jesus is the light of the world. Uh, so I'm going to count to three, and when I get to three, I'm going to say our candle lighting prayer. Um, but I'm wondering, would you help me count down this morning? Okay, so here we go. Three, three two, two, one. one. Welcome, Jesus, the light of the world. Pray in our day with your way and show us how to love. Amen. It's still lit. Ah. <laughs> Testimony to the resilience of love, if there ever was one. Uh, so friends, I'm going to invite you to join me in an old tradition, but a, a tradition that we've kind of fallen out of the habit of. Uh, I'm going to invite you to say with me the words of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, we have two different communities here, two different ways of saying it, so it is not actually printed in your bulletin. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to have a go at it from memory. Uh, again, if you don't know the words, just mumble, say amen at the end, it'll all work itself out. 
Uh, so let us pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And our messy church song this morning is a favorite one, Jesus Loves Me. You are doing your bulletin, friends. Are you ready to sing? Yes. Let's do this. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Right, my messy friends, I have four pictures that I want to show you this morning. What's interesting about these four pictures is that the, there's two ways at least to look at each picture. So when I hold it up, I want you to just yell out the first thing you see. Don't raise your hand. I just want to yell out the first thing you see when I hold up this picture. If you have a hard time seeing, they're also in your bulletin. We're going to go in miracle order. Are you ready? Okay, let's do this. Picture number one, yellow, what do you see? Yeah, so we have mostly duck. We have a little bunny over there in the corner. Good, yeah. It can be a, a duck. There's a duck bill, duck eye. Or it could be a bunny, bunny ears, bunny eye, bunny nose. Think go either way. All right, number two. Number two is actually kind of a scary looking picture. What do you see? Okay, it looks like we're, we're, we're evenly divided on this one, yeah. It can be either a cat or it can be a rat. Exactly, exactly. Okay, number three, this is actually a very famous one. Some of you may have seen this one before. This is called Ruben, well, I will not scream. Ready, here we go, what do you see? Yeah. A candlestick. Yeah, you see people or a vase or a candlestick. Three ways of seeing that one. And number four, this is a new one. I've never seen this one before. I'm pretty excited about it. Number four, what do you see? Donkey or a seal. Yeah. It can go either way. It can go either way. So it's really interesting, isn't it? We, we all can look at the same thing but but we see different things in it we look at the same thing but we see it differently so i'm wondering what you guys think that if i was looking at this picture and i saw a seal 
But my friend Freddy over there, he saw a donkey. Do you think that I should start yelling at Freddy until he starts seeing a seal like I do? Do you think that's a good idea? No. What, what's that? I think you should see a donkey. He thinks I should see a donkey. Yeah, I could change and I could see a donkey. But guys, as you grow up, you're going to run into the situation so many times. You and your friends are going to be together. You're going to be playing on the playground and you're going to come up on a problem. You're going to come up on a situation and you're going to look at it and you're all going to see it in a different way. And rather than think about it, rather than yelling at each other about it, like a lot of adults like to do, a better thing to do in that moment is give thanks to God. Because how amazing is it that God has made us all so different, so special, so unique that all of us can, we can look at the same picture and we can see something different in it. Amen? Amen. 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 That's pretty amazing. Uh, so before we go on, I just want to say a little prayer together, shall we? God, even at young ages, you have given us gifts of being special, of being unique, of seeing the world in different ways. Rather than getting mad at our friends when they see things differently, let us use it as an opportunity to give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I'd like to invite forward Aaron Senat now, who will do our scripture reading for us this morning. Here? Oh, uh, yeah, we're from there. Okay. Hmm. Reading this morning comes from the Apostle Paul letter to the Romans, chapter 14. I invite you to listen to the word of God in these words of scripture. Accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't, and those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. Those who eat any kind of food do so to honor the Lord, since they give thanks to God before eating. And those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. I know and am convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in and of itself is wrong to eat. But if someone believes it is wrong, then for that person it is wrong. And if another believer is distressed by what you eat, you are not acting in love if you eat it. Don't let your eating ruin someone for whom Christ died then you will not be criticized for doing something you believe is good. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God, and others will approve of you too. So then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. Here ends our reading. May we be blessed with understanding. So friends, would you please join with me in a spirit of prayer? Holy and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be forever acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So friends, here is the sitch. Apparently, apparently a conflict had bubbled up among the members of the early Christian church in Rome. I know that might be hard to believe, church folk being notoriously easygoing, not at all want to squabble over foolish things, 
not at all prone to splintering into new denominations over minor disagreements. But as hard as it may be for us to believe it is true, a conflict had indeed bubbled up among this early church community. And this conflict is one that, that to us may seem kind of strange, but I assure you at the time, it made a great deal more sense. You see, their conflict was one that centered on a disagreement over the appropriateness of eating meat. Specifically, the kinds of meat that were considered unclean according to Jewish purity codes as found in my favorite book of the Bible and yours, the book of Leviticus. <laughs> and the battle lines of this conflict, they were clearly drawn, okay? So on the one side, you had Jewish converts to Christianity who believed that under no circumstances should any Christian eat such meat. And then on the other side of this conflict, you had non-Jewish converts to Christianity, or what the Bible calls Gentile converts to Christianity, who believed that eating such meat was perfectly okay and acceptable. You could eat whatever you want. Bologna, pastrami, honey glazed ham, hot dogs, what? you could eat whatever you want. Italian sausage, whatever you want to eat. So what we see happening in this morning's passage Uh, Romans chapter 14. What we see happening in this morning's passage is the Apostle Paul wading into the middle of this controversy in the hopes of settling it once and for all. So that's what's kind of happening at a macro level as we zoom in now to the specific advice for that Paul had for this community in the midst of their conflict. Uh, There is one thing that I want us to remember about our friend Paul. Paul was many things, uh, and among those things that he was, he was a real stickler for doctrinal purity. He cared very deeply that people correctly understood the tenets of their faith and correctly understood uh, the implications of their faith for their day-to-day living. And so Paul wades into this conversation in true Paul form, and he comes in decisively. He comes in decisively down on the side of those who believe that it is indeed okay to eat whatever meat you want to eat. He even goes so far as to fix labels to the various parties of this conflict. So those who believe it is not okay to eat meat, he labels them as weak, and those who believe it is okay to eat meat, he labels them as strong. Now, that is some fairly loaded terminology, to be sure. Uh, But with those labels weak and strong, Paul is not talking about their physical strength. He's not commenting on physical acuity, nor is he even really commenting on the relative strength of their faith, per se. Uh, Rather, what he is commenting on is their ability to to see, to correctly understand the tenets of their faith and apply it to their day-to-day live. So the weak, right? The weak are those who still have a little bit of legalism, a little bit of Phariseeism kicking around in their hearts. And so they believe that it is somehow by their actions, that it is somehow by their right behavior, that they earn God's love. So of course they're worried about eating these ritually impure foods, because they're worried if they do that, they might get booted out. They might get excluded from God's love. So in contrast to them, the strong, the strong are those who who correctly believe, correctly understand that God's love isn't something you can earn. They understand that God's love is a gift. So the strong know that they didn't do anything to earn it. They know they didn't do anything to deserve it. They understand that it is just a freely given gift from God to them, and so they recognize that it matters not one iota what you eat or drink, because it has no bearing on God's love whatsoever. If you didn't do anything to earn God's love, the flip side of that is you can't do anything to lose it either. So one might expect, certainly I would expect, given this situation, given Paul being who Paul is, I would kind of expect Paul just to to step in, call the weak out for their their, their wrongheadedness, 
and tell them to get with the program. But that's not what Paul does at all. He throws us a bit of a curveball here. Instead, what Paul does is he steps in and he addresses both groups. And he tells each to stop condemning the other over inconsequential matters such as this. Stop squabbling over stupid little trivial stuff is Paul's basic message here. At the end of the day, says Paul, so long as you believe in God's love, so long as you trust that Jesus will help you ground your life in that love, so long as you have that going for you, nothing else matters. Everything else is just window dressing. It's not worth fighting over whatsoever. However, <laughs> however, says Paul, and this is a fairly significant however, however, he says, in this situation, if anyone needs to change, it is the strong who need to change. That is, it is the people who have correctly understood their faith and their implications for their day-to-day -day life who need to change. If your eating meat causes distressing, distress to the weaker members of your community, says Paul, even though you and I both know you're in the right, then it is up to you to change your ways out of love for them because you should not want to be a stumbling block to any sibling in Christ. Oh. So you can be 100% right, and because there's some joker in your community who, who doesn't understand correctly, even though you are right, you are the one who needs to change what the people of God say, oh. <laughs> oh. That doesn't feel right, does it? That doesn't, people are un-American, right? That's not the, the, the flag-waving, eagle-soaring sort of rugged individualism that we are used to. You can be 100% right, understand Christianity perfectly, and you are still the one who needs to change. So that's what Paul's message is. He's saying you can, you can understand doctrine perfectly. You can understand its implications for your day-to-day -day life perfectly. You can be a paragon of Christian virtue in your day-to-day -day life. But if your perfection is somehow causing a brother or sister to stumble, it is incumbent on you to have to change, to do things differently. Oh, oh that just doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel right. And it begs the question for us this morning, I think, why bother? Why bother participating in a faith community full of people who from time to time are going to get on your nerves? They're going to aggravate you. They're going to cause your blood pressure to go through the ceiling. And from time to time, when you're involved in a disagreement, even though you are in the right, it's going to cause you to have to change what you are doing. Why bother? Why not just stay at home? read your Bible, pray a little, and live life as you know you ought to live it. Why bother? And moreover, and perhaps even more to the point, I mean, here we are, two different churches, two different cultures, two different ways of doing things, right? Two different ways of saying the Lord's Prayer, for instance, two distinct ways of bringing the good news into the world. And yet somehow over the course of the pandemic, we just kind of got thrown into this thing together and here we be. No one signed up for this. This was not part of our, of our strategic plans and yet here we are. So why not just pack up and go back to our own little corners of Medford? Why stick with each other and try to make this thing work when we might have to change, why bother? Well, uh, my, my good friend, my, my, one of my favorite theologians, C.S. Lewis, uh, in his book, The Four Loves, 
he actually takes up this exact question. Uh, and in one section of the, that book, he talks about a literary society of which he was a part called the Inklings, uh, which was actually basically a group of authors who got together on a regular basis to talk about literary type things, whatever that may be. Uh, and while this was actually quite a large group, uh, among those people, three people in particular had a deep friendship that formed. It was C.S. Lewis, a guy by the name of Charles Williams, uh, and none other than J.R.R. Tolkien himself, who C.S. Lewis refers to affectionately by his first name, or technically his second first name, Ronald. Uh, so at some point, their, their mutual friend there, Charles, had passed away. So in this section of the book, C.S. Lewis is, is kind of meditating on the changed dynamics of his relationship with his friend, Ronald. Uh, and this is what he has to say. I'm going to read it to you. C.S. Lewis says this. He says, In each of my friends, there is something that only some other friend can fully bring out. By myself, I am not large enough to call the whole man into activity. I want other lights than my own to show all his facets. Now that Charles is dead, I shall never again see Ronald's reaction to a specifically Charles joke. Far from having more of Ronald, far from having him to myself, now that Charles is passed away, I actually have less of Ronald. So what C.S. Lewis is getting at there is that it takes an entire community it takes an entire community just to know a single individual. It takes an entire community just to know a, a, a single human being, to pull out all their facets, all their characteristics, all their little quirks. It takes an entire community. And he goes on to argue, if that is true of a single human being, how much truer, how much truer is it of God. Why should we put up with the hassle of community? Because it is together that we get a fuller picture of God's goodness. Together we, we get a, a fuller sense of what Christ's grace is all about. Together we get a fuller picture of the Spirit's working in our lives and in the world. Together we get a fuller picture than we ever could, than we ever, ever, ever could by ourselves. So may we, vegans and vegetarians and committed carnivores, <laughs> may we trespassers and sinners, may we hillsiders and sanctuarians, may we be open to the fullness of God revealed in communities just like this. In Jesus' name, amen. Are we singing now or during communion? During? Which means that we're just going to roll right into communion here now, friends. Uh, so in the name of the risen Christ, all of God's children are welcome to participate in this communion meal. Except... Except this morning, we want to extend a special welcome to those of you who are married and those of you who are divorced, those who are widowed, those who are happily single, and those who spend hours every day swiping right indiscriminately. You are likewise welcome here if you are gay or lesbian or transgender, whether you are filthy rich or dirt poor, whether you speak English real, real good like or no habla inglés. We especially welcome screaming babies and excited toddlers, not to mention their adult caretakers, both the sleepy and the well-caffeinated. We welcome you whether you can sing like Madonna or are better left lip syncing to all of our hymns. You're welcome here if you are just browsing, just woke up, or just got out of jail. You're likewise welcome here if you love ball and Red Sox, or even if you're more of a <coughs> Yankees fan. You'll find no judgment here. Well, maybe a little bit. 
but we don't care if you're more Christian than the Pope or haven't been to church since Easter three years ago. We extend a special welcome to those who are over 60 but not grown up yet, and to teenagers who are growing up too fast. Whether you are a dog person or a cat person or an iguana person, a morning person or a night owl, a Coke or a Pepsi drinker, an iPhone or an Android user, an Instagram all-star, or a social media slouch, you are welcome here. And in short, what I'm trying to get at is that every one of Alaska, every last one of God's children is welcome at this meal. Let no one build a wall where God has thrown open the doors. But all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And let us pray. Eternal God, who has created the heavens and the earth, giving breath to every living thing, we thank you for all the gifts of creation and for the gift of life itself. We bless you for the beauty and the bounty of the earth and for the vision of the day when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. We thank you for making us in your own image, for forgiving us when we act as though you have no claim on us, and for keeping us in your steadfast care. We rejoice in Jesus, our brother, born of Mary, who shared the joys and sorrows of life as we know it. We remember his death, celebrate his resurrection, and in the beloved community of your church, we await his coming in glory. Amen. And friends, we remember how on the night before he died, Jesus was at table with his friends and he took bread and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Whenever you do this, he said, remember me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took his juice box and after giving you thanks, he gave it to the disciples saying, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for one and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you do this, remember me. But this is the part of the service we ask everybody to warm up their blessing hands, both here at Shannon Beach and at home. Hold your hands over your bread and your juice as we ask God's blessing be upon them. Gentle Redeemer, there is no limit to your blessing and no end to your grace. Send your spirit of life and love, power and blessing upon every table where your children shelter in place. That this bread may be broken and gathered in love and this cup poured out to give hope to all. Risen Christ, live and breathe in us that we may live and breathe in you. Amen. And now friends, let us in our many places receive the gift of God, the bread of heaven. We are one in Christ in the bread we share. And let us in our many places receive the gift of God, the cup of blessing. We are one in Christ in the cup we share.
Uh, so it didn't make your way its way into your bulletins, but we wanted to offer a time to lift up your prayers, whatever joys or concerns may be on your hearts this morning. Uh, if you have a prayer request, I just invite you, if you're live, to, to raise your hand, share your request, and then I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, and I invite everybody to say back at me, hear our prayer. And we'll, if you want to collect the prayers over there on the chat box, we'll be with you in just one minute. Uh, so does anybody have any joys or concerns that care to lift up this morning? We'll start here with Mary. The Afghanistan, uh, the people who have been killed, and also for the American families who have also been in this recent um, yeah. Yeah. Yes, prayers for all the people of Afghanistan, people who have lost loved ones on either side of the conflict. Uh, during this very difficult season over there. Lord, in your mercy, Paul? Uh, Hi, Tom. Oh, hold on one second. What's taking him on chat box? Hang on, Jeff. Okay. She's having her first child uh, today, I think. Oh. What was your sister's name? Elizabeth, for Elizabeth and the birth of their first child, hopefully today, Lord, in your mercy. Uh, my wife has a, a, a hernia, and it's starting to bother her a lot, and I, I'm hoping that I can get a doctor for her and get it, get it fixed. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's rough. Yeah. It's praise for Rice, Ray's wife, rather, her hernia. Uh, to get the help that she needs, Lord, in your mercy. Yes, yeah, so it's prayer for all the kids returning to school. I know we have lots of little ones going to school. Uh, we also have AJ Olapate going off to college, which is pretty exciting. Uh, and of course, for all teachers, uh, everybody may be safe and have all the the PPE and protocols that they need uh, in case to be safe. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, for all business owners struggling because of this continued pandemic, Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Uh, I want to say a little blessing for Stephanie, who's starting ACS. So the ACS this week, she's teaching this week in class. Oh, oh, there we go. Sorry. There we go. Uh, yeah, so the blessings that the exhaustion doesn't overtake you too quickly. Uh, in her first week, she already was sending people over to the UCC, sending them over our way. So thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> You're doing good work. Uh, so for Stephanie, Lord, in your mercy, here. Double dipping. Uh, <laughs> my, my sister was Colorado, but that, that, that was COVID, and I, I feel uh, she has mild symptoms so far. I hope they stay that way. Uh, prayers for Ray's sister who has contracted COVID. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. For Anita's brother, Andy, and his family, uh, he passed away this week. Uh, prayers for them in this time of grief and transition. Lord, in your mercy. I'm going to run over here to the chat box and see what, what prayers are awaiting us over here. Uh, I see 21 new messages. So, <laughs> uh, so Tom, Tom, I can give them to you. Um, oh, uh, Jeff, so Jeff and Ginny do not have chat because they're on the phone. Uh, so we included Anita over here and Shelly prays for a smooth and successful transition to eighth grade uh, in the new school year. And that's it except okay. for Jeff. Okay. Uh, so, so Anita, we had already had prayers for you waiting in the chat box. Um, and then Shelly prays for a smooth transition for all students back uh, to school. And Jeff, do you want to share? Jeff can't share. He doesn't have chat, so he's going to share. Jeff, do you want to unmute yourself and share your prayers? Yeah, I'm home. Jeff is home. That's a. The computer is at the, and the computer is at the uh, Staples at MGH getting a virus out of it. 
Oh, Lord, Jeff, your computer issues are endless. Well, we will pray for that as well. Um, so Jeff is at the hospital. That's an answer to our many prayers uh, and ongoing <laughs> prayers for just poor tech issues. Ugh. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Are there any other prayers folks would care to lift? Is that okay, let's, well, we're going to wrap this bad boy up. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes, everybody on the path of Ida coming to Louisiana. Yeah. So for that, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We're getting a little rain here at Shannon Beach. Oh, and for the people of Haiti as well, Lord, in your mercy. Uh, let's pray very quickly. Gracious and loving God, we come to this place from many different paths, from different houses, different backgrounds, different preferences, different focuses, different passions, different families, different stories. But when we gather in your name, it is not those differences that define us, but your love. In the spirit of Christian unity, we pray for our neighbors in our own faith community and our neighbors around the world in distress, in joy, and in everything in between. Even as we hold all these things in our hearts, O oh God, we lift these prayers up to you, the said and the unsaid, in the name of the one who takes down barriers to foster love, Jesus the Christ. Amen. 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 Uh, and now, friends, go forth this day in peace, holding fast to what is good and returning no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, honor all people, and in all things, love and serve the God that we know in Christ Jesus, rejoicing always in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And now a, a song to leave by. We will walk with God in the rain. Oh. <laughs> one, two, three, one. We will walk with God.